Yeah, my first question was um, uh, to do with your, your background and yes. your family. So I was wondering if you could speak more about um, your heritage. And, uh, where are your Yiddish roots from? Um, okay. Are your I, 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 think yeah. I uh, am a second generation American, that mm -hmm. is U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. My late parents were uh, immigrants from Poland. Mm -hmm. When they were born and growing up, they were born Russian subjects. Poland did not exist as a state, and, uh, and they were from the Russian partition. But uh, they were quite young when Polish independence was declared in November 1918. Uh, it was a very bitter time, especially for Jews, and they had the good fortune to immigrate to the United States uh, in the early 1920s. Uh, my late mother, uh, Tsil, uh, her English name was Sylvia uh, Kleiman. Um, she was the youngest child um, of um, also very religious parents. And so they lived in a village, um, I think it was in the part of Poland that had the large Ukrainian population. It was probably a Ukrainian village. There were only two Jewish families, my maternal family, the Kleimans at one end, and another Jewish family at the other. My maternal grandfather died when my mother, she was the youngest child, she was only a year and a half old, so she had no visual memory of her father, only stories. He died of tuberculosis. He was about 39 or 40 years old, and he left my grandmother with five living children in very dire straits. And um, she had to divide up the babies, the younger, to, with family, and she took the older children to Warsaw and found employment as a seamstress and then managed to reunite her family and they lived in dire poverty in one room in an attic in a garret in the heart of Jewish proletarian Warsaw. And my mother had to quit school. She went to work when she was eight years old. My mother had her oldest sister who immigrated to the United States, to New York City. Uh, she was a revolutionary, she was a Bundist, and she belonged to the Bund in Warsaw. My aunt, Esther Yenyes, Yenyes, she left as a very young woman, 19, something like that, uh, just before the outbreak of the First World War. And the thought was that she would find work and send money to bring her mother and her younger siblings. But of course the First World War broke out and she was separated from her family for seven years, which were seven years of misery and horror for my mother and her siblings and my grandmother, war and starvation and pogroms, and revolution and counter-revolution and so on. But um, Finally, uh, very lucky, uh, in 1921, uh, she sent uh, enough money uh, to bring her mother, my grandmother, the only grandparent I ever knew, although I was only three when she died, and um, two of the siblings, because one aunt had died of the Spanish influenza uh, when they were preparing to leave. So this was the last year of what is historically inaccurately called free and unrestricted immigration. That was, it was only for people of the so-called white race and Europeans and so on. There were plenty of <laughs> restrictions and even for Europeans, but... And um, it was the year that the United States adopted the immigration quotas based on racist thinking. So my mother was very, very lucky. I'm lucky I'm here because of this that um, my grandmother and two of her daughters uh, immigrated through Ellis Island to New York in the fall of 1921. Actually, my late father 
immigrated to Cuba, but that's a story in itself, mm -hmm. but eventually he made his way to New York City. Mm -hmm. So um, my parents were either speaking, but they were multilingual. My, mm -hmm. my mother spoke Polish, my mother spoke Russian, mm -hmm. uh, English, of course. Uh, my dad was not as multilingual as my mother because he came from a very traditional um, Orthodox Hasidic background where men led a cloister life and, and he was a yeshiva student and, and Yiddish was his language, although he had a smattering of, of other languages. Mm -hmm. So, And uh, my parents were caught up in the Yiddish cultural movement, which was very strong in the 1920s and in the interwar years. So we spoke Yiddish at home, not as, you know, um, a necessity because mm -hmm. we didn't know other languages, but because my parents wanted me to have that uh, cultural background. They knew that I'd learned English <laughs> and I'd learned other languages. So, so um, I'm curious to hear how that multilingualism um, influenced uh, your interest in specifically Yiddish. Um, how, like, since there were so many, I guess, things to, so many different influences, um, yeah. how is it specifically Yiddish culture that you think maybe your parents stuck to through the immigration? Or Well, as I said, I think my parents thought that Yiddish was a key mm -hmm. to modern, their modern Jewish secular identity and, mm -hmm. and culture, and, and, and they implanted that feeling in me. So, mm -hmm. you know, they provided me with um, education, uh, extracurricular, right? I went through the public school system, and, mm -hmm. but um, I, I started uh, Yiddish school in nursery. I probably could win an award as having the longest <laughs> Yiddish secular education from nursery to university <laughs> level. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it impressed me. I, I saw the greatness of the literature. And, uh, of course, I became a historian professionally. Mm -hmm. I was in an area in which Yiddish was very important. I, uh, my field of specialization was the history of the Jewish labor and socialist movement in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. in uh, North America, and pre-state land of Israel. So mm -hmm. Yiddish was key yeah. in, in that field. Mm -hmm. And where would you say right now is um, the, I guess, the modern state of affairs. Where does Yiddish fall um, in the context of the Jewish peoplehood, um, especially maybe in the context of um, Israel and Hebrew? Yeah, well, it's a complicated question because, sadly, the state of Yiddish is a, a very weak one at the present time, and the causes are quite clear. Mm -hmm. um, Israel, of course, is a great center of Yiddish studies, and that's perfectly logical, despite the very negative attitudes toward the language and culture for a long period in the history of modern Zionism and pre-state and the earlier period of the state. But it's logical because Israel is becoming the center of uh, Jewish cultural creativity and uh, and Jewish scholarship, and it's only natural that Yiddish, which has played such an important role in the last thousand years of Jewish history, that that would be an important area of study and research in Israel. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one positive point on the map. Uh, for the last five years, I've been teaching in the um, Tel Aviv University intensive summer program in Yiddish studies, mm -hmm. uh, named in memory of uh, Naomi uh, Prava Kadar, late uh, Naomi uh, was a personal friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very exciting uh, to be at Tel Aviv University and to have Israeli students uh, although we have students from many, many countries. It's a wonderful program that attracts a large number of students. We yeah. 
had 110 students in the last two summers, uh, 110 students Were each, you each you summer. Last summer? Yeah, yes, I just taught there. Uh, I okay. teach the advanced uh, level in literature. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's kind of the context of Israel, but what does, I guess, um, how is uh, the education of uh, and uh, sustainability of um, Yiddish language and culture in North America? Um, and, uh, do you see it developing, growing, or maybe diminishing? When I arrived at McGill in September 1971, it was a wonderful time. First of all, I was 26. Great time. And it was a wonderful time in Montreal and for Jewish Montreal in particular. There was something very good about my Jewish students at the very beginning of my academic career. Some of them were still the products of East European immigrant homes. And if not the parental home, the grandparents' home, but parental home. So I actually had students who knew Yiddish fairly well. Not to mention that Montreal had a multilingual Jewish day school system, but with Yiddish as a fundamental component. The Yiddish Peretrum, the Yiddish Folkrum, they amalgamated in 1970, the Peretrum and But those who really knew Yiddish well, as, as I have to credit my knowledge because they were born into Yiddish speaking homes. With the, all due respect to good teachers and academic courses, etc., etc. Why was this great? Because we could actually read text, we could actually confront the text without having to resort to dictionaries all the time and translations and struggling over these things. Of course, as the years passed, such students became rarer and rarer until they became almost non-existent and one had to depend upon learning a language, mastering a language. Well, I retired uh, five years ago mm -hmm. and although I have some sense of what goes on in various fields of interest. interest. Uh, it's not as uh, you know intense as it was when I was uh, professionally engaged full time. Mm -hmm. uh, I I don't know. I have a sense. I think that the number of honor students, majors. Mm -hmm. in Jewish studies is declining, mm -hmm. which if true is a troubling, a troubling fact because uh, these are the people who are, should go on to do serious graduate work and, mm -hmm. and join. Uh, on the one hand, there, there is, you know, there are offerings across the country and, and the United States and Canada and uh, some serious work is being done. Uh, on the other hand, of course, we'd like to see much more and we also like to see a strengthening of standards. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question of the degree, of, you know, the level that is achieved by the students uh, not to mention some of the instructors, <laughs> uh, you know, leaves something to be desired. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are a few excellent, very bright and well-trained people, but mm -hmm. I'd like to see stronger numbers. Mm -hmm. um, what does the term Yiddish revival mean to you? Uh, I think we have to be very careful mm -hmm. about using this term. Mm -hmm. It's true that there is a revival in comparison to the previous period when very little as far as Yiddish language instruction and, uh, and teaching the literature in the original, not just in translation. Mm -hmm. There's been a growth there. 
uh, which is to be greeted and appreciated, but as I say, one would like to see the continuity and the strengthening of that and the upgrading of the quality. So, uh, you know, there are people who like to cheer and lay flags and are very optimistic, but I think that revival has to be seen in a specific framework. And it's a positive sign, but we can't rest on our laurels and uh, a lot more has to be demanded. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of uh, literature actually about how um, the term Yiddish revival in a way undermines um, the fact that uh, Yiddish culture and language has um, been alive this entire time um, and that there has been a community and yes. I was wondering if you could speak to that maybe either for or against it or how you see that. Yeah, I'm glad that you've raised this because, you know, sometimes people uh, are involved in self-promotion mm -hmm. or and they say they have discovered something or uh, they have revived something and uh, other times others credit them with this, but there has been a community, albeit perhaps small, but throughout the period since the end of the Second World War, mm -hmm. there have been people who were very much aware of what was created in Yiddish and what continues to be created in this period and so on. And uh, <laughs> they don't, you know, have to have things uncovered or discovered. Of course, we welcome scholarship and, and, and you know, new approaches and so on. But um, yes, there, there have been some important ach new achievements. Mm -hmm. But again, it has to be taken in context and with a grain of salt and not exaggerated. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I also wanted to know a little bit more about your relationship with Clouds Canada. Um, so you've been a returning uh, faculty member. Oh yeah, there. for a long time. I, yeah. I think it's said that Class Canada is in its 20th year. <laughs> and uh, when Class Canada was established, I was not invited to participate. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was true for certainly the first year, perhaps the second year. But after that, I received an invitation to lecture, and uh, there's been very positive response, if I may say so, <laughs> to my offerings. and. I've been invited back, uh, I think I've been, this is probably my 18th summer, mm -hmm. and I enjoy it very much. I, I enjoy meeting people who are interested in these subjects, and uh, I enjoy it if I'm successful in stimulating interest in topics that are not well known. <laughs> I have not discovered them, but I am very well aware of them, and I, mm -hmm. and I try to, to bring this... Uh, uh, to people. So you attended my talk about Pinchas Rutenberg. Mm -hmm. and Pinchas Rutenberg is one of the pioneer figures mm -hmm. in laying the foundations for the creation of the State of Israel. Mm -hmm. Sadly, the name is not that well known today, particularly in the diaspora, mm -hmm. but uh, among the cognoscenti, those who study Russian Jewish history, those who study the history of Zionism, those who study the history of the state. Pinochus mm -hmm. Rutenberg is a very significant figure, and I'm very happy to help increase the number of people who are aware of the contributions of people of that caliber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so where do you think... Um, what role does Klutz Canada play in the continuity, continuity of Yiddish language and culture? Yeah, so, well, I think it plays a positive role in, you know, there are a number of people, I'm not the only one, there are a number of people in the field of Yiddish mm -hmm. uh, who are at Klez, and uh, again, I think they, 
you know, do very good work in introducing these subjects and stimulating interest and pointing people in the right direction, not only with topics and information, but bibliography sources and what to do, mm -hmm. you know, how to continue. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people mentioned at Clouds Canada uh, that there's a bit of a generational gap, that um, there's a lot of uh, young, young musicians that yes. come there that are um, sort of their interest in the, the Yiddish language and culture part is a little bit more narrow than um, their interest in the musical right. genres. Narrow in what sense? Well, um, what, what do they want to focus on? I mean, that it's a very, um, from what several people have told me, that yeah. it's a very surfaced interest, that it might not be inherently something that they see as an integral part of... Um, of their like klezmer identity, that it's something that's right. supplementary to okay. like the musical base. Well, obviously, we cannot foist our interests and loyalties and passions mm -hmm. on other people, but um, and of course, you can be a very fine klezmer musician as an instrumentalist mm -hmm. without a knowledge of the Yiddish language, but. One would hope, if one wants to present songs, mm -hmm. if one is a vocalist, that one will master the language and so that you actually get people who can enunciate and who understand what they're singing and under, really understand the text so that they can interpret it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot has to be done. Mm -hmm. Looking into the future, what are the most, um, what are the pillars of sustaining Yiddish culture and language, or what, what is it that we can look? Well, the on? most important thing is study, of course. And, you know, not uh, a superficial approach, and uh, not limiting the repertoire to uh, three or four songs, mm -hmm. uh, but really digging deep. Uh, in a language sense, mastering the language to open up the treasures mm -hmm. uh, that are available. And of course, there are un untapped sources. There's still much to be retrieved. There's mm -hmm. much to be done. And, uh, and you need trained people to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, in language is an integral part of that. Exactly. And you see, even, you know, in the lands of Eastern Europe, where the Holocaust took the greatest toll, mm -hmm. there are still significant vestiges of this language and culture. And you know, I don't know if the name Dogbert Kerwa means anything to you. He's a major uh, Yiddish linguist, philologist mm -hmm. at the uh, University of Indiana. And he conducts a major project and going into Ukraine, going into Belarus, uh, going into areas where the, the last generation of native speakers of Yiddish, where there are still people, and uh, interviewing people, uh, recording their dialects, recording their memories, recording the songs that they know, their experiences. Uh, David Katz, a teacher of Kala, Keller, by the way, is the son of the late poet, Soviet Yiddish poet, mm -hmm. Yosef Keller, who was the first Yiddish literary dissident in the Soviet Union. And after a very long and bitter struggle, won his right to leave the Soviet Union for the state of Israel with his family. So there's what we call Yichas, noble ancestry in the Jewish sense there. Uh, and there's a beautiful documentary film, by the way, about the poet Yosef Kala in Yiddish with the participation of his son. And it is a beautiful interweaving of the generations mm -hmm. of the father and his life and career and, and heroism. He's dead, and the son 
very much vital, creative figure, and that intense relationship would still exists even after the death of the father. So, David Katz is also doing this work, centered in Vilna, or Vilnius, mm-hmm. the capital of Lithuania, but going into other areas. There are people working with them, but mm-hmm. I, uh, we need young scholars yeah. who, who can do this kind of work effectively, and that means mastering the language. Mm-hmm. And that is some, um, I was going to, my, my last question yes. was, um, what would be, I guess, the educate, like, how would we go forward um, as academics or as, um, in an educational sense yes. of what needs to be improved through our institutions, or maybe um, it's more of a social, like, a, a social initiative that needs to start first and then um, move forward. Well, of course... The major scholars in the field, whether they're in the United States or Canada or Israel or France, uh, are known, and, and students make their choices where and with whom they're going to study. But uh, in addition to the teacher-student relationship, it's most important for students to immerse themselves in the literature to read broadly and deeply, and uh, this is the key uh, to the future of Yiddish studies. Mm-hmm. Um, just one more question, sure. actually. Uh, because um, there is no uh, like homeland yes. uh, for yes. Yiddish yes. speakers, um, what does immersion entail, and what does that mean, uh, aside from just literature? Yes, now you, you've touched on a very sore point. Because um, immersion means speaking. Now, there is a larger Yiddish speaking community, but it's generally ultra Orthodox, or what we call Haredi mm-hmm. in Ivrit. Uh, generally Hasidic, but also certain Misnagda communities. And this is a problematic situation because with the exception of uh, rare individuals who cross the line, so to speak, between ultra-Orthodoxy and having contact with secular culture, Mm -hmm. those communities are generally closed to the great treasures of modern secular Yiddish literature of the last uh, two centuries. Mm -hmm. Also, what the state of the language is in those communities is problematic because in many instances, it pains me to say it's quite degraded. but of course one has to take advantage and, and where it's possible to to make contact with fluent speakers in the Haredi community, that's important. Unfortunately, in the, the secular Jewish national community, the number of native speakers is small, but students have to take advantage of that. But it's difficult. I myself, you know, at times, I, the influence of English or other language is so powerful, yeah. and uh, I have to dig back into my acoustic memory if I can't find something in the dictionary, in dictionaries in the plural, or in uh, literary sources. Think back, you know, mm-hmm. how, you know, what did I hear 50 or 60 years ago? Uh, there is an important recorded literature. Mm-hmm. A uh, great scholar, the late Uriel Weinreich, who died tragically at the age of 42 in New York. Mm-hmm. I was in his last graduate seminar at Columbia University. He was the director of a great project of the Linguistic and Cultural Atlas of Ashkenazi Jewry. And this goes back 60 years, 50 some odd, 60. Mm-hmm. And many recordings were made of native speakers, and those have all been preserved. So mm-hmm. for serious students, 
you know, you go to the archives and uh, mm-hmm. you put on the headphones and you listen. Mm-hmm. So it's um, so the main, I guess, sources, uh, from what I understand, are uh, in the Haredi uh, community and deep in academia. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very. much.